This video is made possible by Brilliant. In 2005, NASA did a study and it was estimated that the area covered by lawns in the United States of America is about 163,000 square kilometers. That's huge. For the perspective, this area is bigger than the whole country of Bangladesh, which has 165 million population and twice as big than the whole Ireland. Turf grass, which is the lawn on the American house yards, is the biggest irrigated plant in the US, more than corn, wheat, and fruit orchards combined. Lawns consume nearly 3 trillion gallons of water every single year. So in this video, we will talk about what if lawns are replaced by vegetable or flower gardens and the case against the lawns. Grass lawns were first popularized in the US in the late 1700s by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who both loved European architecture and landscape design. They bought the idea of a sprawling green landscape to Mount Vernon and Monticello, respectively. The Lawns were extremely popular in England before then. British aristocrats started planting them sometime around the start of the 16th and 17th centuries, and of course, they had to maintain it. So they used grazing animals like sheep and goats. Then in 1830, a British closing mill mechanic invented the landmower, which allowed those around the world to reduce the amount of time and manpower required for maintaining a lawn. Further inventions, such as a sprinkler and chemical fertilizer, have established the lawn as an item of leisure and something to take pride in. In 1906, US President Thomas Jefferson, who was also an avid horticulturist, was among the first to replicate European lawn styling in America at his estate. Other wealthy US landowners followed suit, but most yards stayed devoted to vegetable and herb gardens. At the time of the Great Depression, from 1929 till 1935, a lot of people planted gardens. Then again, in World War II, it was a matter of national pride to have a big garden, to grow vegetables vegetables and being self-sustaining to support the war effort. After World War II, it was looked as a sign of hard times and a sign of being too poor to buy your food. In the 1950s and 1960s, American suburbs grew in population. Economy was booming, so did growing lawns. Today, there is a significant industry that exists around lawn care and management. From equipments to chemicals to seed, lawns require knowledge time and money. The state of a homeowner's lawn is important in relation to their status within the community and to the status of the community at large. Lawns connect neighbors and neighborhoods. They are viewed as an indicator of socioeconomic character, which translates into property and resale values. Lawns are an indicator of success. They are a physical manifestation of the American dream of homeownership. To have a well-maintained lawn is a sign to others that you have the time and the money to support this attraction. It signifies that you care about your belonging and want others to see that you are like them. A properly maintained lawn tells others that you are a good neighbor as realtors use this tactic to convince buyers that your potential house is in a good neighborhood. Many homeowner associations have regulations to the effect of how often a lawn must be maintained. It's so important for some associations that they fine you if your lawn is not maintained and not at a certain length. In an oversimplification, the history of turf grass lawns is that only kings and aristocrats had it first to flex on each other. Slowly but surely, middle class people wanted to feel like kings and queens, so they adopted it as well. So basically, in modern terms, before the internet, having a well-maintained lawn was like flexing your NFTs or fancy cars on social media. Pretty much by definition, a lawn is unnatural. Still, there are degrees of unnaturalness. Even as the American lawn was being democratized, it was also becoming more artificial. Lawns do provide some benefits. Green spaces help reduce the urban heat island effect, lowering the temperature of the entire metro area. They can help restore groundwater and reduce urban flooding. And because they are plants, they pull a small amount of carbon dioxide out of the air. Additionally, they are generally pleasing places for kids to play. But on balance, lawns do not have a productive value and are awful for the planet. Turf grass is the largest irrigated agricultural plant in America. More than corn, wheat and fruit orchards combined, to maintain landmovers account for 5% of air pollution in America. Each year, more than 17 million gallons of fuel are spilled during the refilling of garden equipment. That's more than the oil that Exxon Valdez spilled. 
homeowners spend billions of dollars and typically use 10 times the amount of pesticides and fertilizers per acre on their lawns as farmers do on crops. The majority of these chemicals are wasted due to the inappropriate timing and application. These chemicals then run off and become a major source of water pollution. To be more precise, each year across the country, lawns consume nearly 3 trillion gallons of water, 200 million gallons of gas for mowing, and 70 million pounds of pesticides. As we said, NASA-led study in 2005 found that there were 136,000 square kilometers of turf grass in the US. And I can't stress enough how big it is. It's a combined area of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. All America's farmland consumes 110 billion cubic meters of water a year. Lawns, on the other hand, with a fraction of the land, drink an estimated two-thirds as much. Most municipalities use about 30-75% to 75 of drinking water on lawns. During the drought in Los Angeles, California, 70% of water loss came courtesy of lawns. All this effort, of course, isn't cheap. Americans spend more than $36 billion every year on lawn care, almost five times more than the annual budget of the Environmental Protection Agency, and twice as big as NASA's budget. If American lawn care business was a country, it would be 96th place, having higher GDP more than 100 countries. Water and soil usage aside, lawns also create a type of monoculture that represents the opposite of a biodiverse ecosystem. Monoculture areas do not attract a plethora of different insect species. Pollinators like bees, moths, and butterflies are vital for the growth of flower beds, apple trees, and the farms surrounding the neighborhood. Without pollinators, there wouldn't be no cherry blossoms or berries. Without berries and the insects that live on the plants, birds would be hard to put make a living in the neighborhood where there are only carpet lawns. One of the most important cases against the lawns is how unbelievable amount of soil is used for the sake of social status and aesthetics. Arable soil that has been used as lawns in America is the same size as Florida and twice as big as Italy's total arable soil. It's even bigger than the arable land of huge countries like Iran which supports its population of more than 80 million people. The most important case against lawns is honeybees and pollinators. Honeybees, wild and domestic, perform about 80% of all pollination worldwide. A single bee colony can pollinate 300 million flowers each day. Grains are primarily pollinated by the wind, but fruits, nuts, and vegetables are pollinated by bees. 70 out of top 100 human food crops, which supply about 90% of the world's nutrition, are pollinated by bees as well. Bees are dying worldwide, and there are lots of reasons like pesticides, drought, habitat destruction, air pollution, nutrition deficit, and more. Many of these causes are interrelated, but the bottom line is that humans are responsible for the two most prominent causes pesticides and habitat loss. Lawns do contribute to the extermination of bees because of pesticides and the replacement of natural habitats. Fortunately, there are many alternatives to turf grass lawns. Since it's planted on arable soil, vegetable gardens and fruit trees are the best alternatives to useless green carpets. There are many edible plants that could serve a whole family and look nice. A bush of rosemary, a lemon tree, some peppers, saffron flowers. A lot of these plants don't need to be grown in large quantities as well. For example, rosemary is great, bees love it. But ideally, flowers and plants native to the specific area could replace lawns. They require less maintenance because it's natural climate. Native plants are important for the health and biodiversity of pollinators and thus the survival of entire ecological communities. The western US has been suffering from extreme drought for a couple of years now. The largest reservoirs have reached their lowest water levels in history. Under the Colorado River Basin, low reservoir levels have triggered the first shortage declaration in history, and the Colorado River is drying up. In Arizona, Nevada, and California, governments are actually paying homeowners to rip out their lawns and replace it with artificial turf or landscaping that doesn't need water. In California, the government is offering programs that pay to replace homeowners
homeowners' lawns with native plants. And I personally propose that homeowners should replace with beautiful drought-resistant flowers like honeybee-friendly blanket flower and all other perennial flowers and plants that bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, and all other pollinators love. And arguably, it looks way better than green carpets. In order to understand statistics around how lawns are bad for the planet, it's always good to have a scientific approach and thinking. So one of the best ways to improve your scientific thinking is Brilliant.org. This video is made possible by Brilliant. It's a website with interactive courses and quizzes that let you dive into the topics like the ones I have shown in this video, including calculus, solar energy programming, Python, and many more. I'm taking courses in the science section. It's helping me to think like a scientist, statistician, and physicist. I love the way how interactive it is and the way they scaffold you through a topic building your confidence and understanding as you go. Join the millions of people already learning on Brilliant with a special offer just for you. Head to brilliant.org slash curious reason to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 listeners will also get 20% off of an annual membership. Well, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more. And thanks for everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Your support means a lot.